All right, so I think now we are live. Um, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to our September NHSR webinar on package development. My name is Anastasia, and on the line we have Jane Tom, uh, and we will be helping on some tech, uh, te technical questions, some facilitation, and we'll uh, try to manage questions as well, if there will be any. Um, Chris is also on the line, and uh, he will be running the session today for us. So thank you, Chris, for joining. Uh, before we kick off, I uh, just had a few bits of housekeeping. Uh, this webinar is being recorded uh, and we will be sharing the materials afterwards on the website uh, and you will also be able to access all code uh, on GitHub and link will be on our website as well. Uh, we will run until approximately 2 p.m. Um, if you have any questions, please post them in the Q&A section and uh, Chris will answer them uh, at the end of the webinar and we'll also pause uh, in, in the middle. Um, and uh, just a few other things to mention uh, from the community. Uh, we have opened registration for the NHSR Community Virtual Conference, uh, which will be the part of large November festival. Um, we will start announcing our program very soon, but in the meantime, please make sure that you register it and uh, then we will be able to stay in touch with you and uh, speak to you about logistics of the event and share with you all materials and links. Um, we will share the special link later uh, in the announcement section. Also, we are planning to run webinars um, as this on the third Wednesday of each month. Uh, again, from 1 till 2 p.m. If you're interested in running a webinar, please contact us and we will be in touch with you. Um, uh, please to join our Slack. Uh, we will send the link as well in the, the announcement section. Uh, it's a nice place to chat with everyone and ask your questions if you have any. Um, and last but not least, we are planning to use Mentimeter to get the feedback and we will announce the link at the end of the webinar. Um, so please let us know how did the webinar go and it will be great to have your feedback and to make our webinars better. Um, please uh, make sure that you uh, subscribe, uh, that you're on the Slack and that you are following us on Twitter so you can uh, be uh, in touch with us and you can know about uh, next October webinar. Um, and now I uh, don't have any other th things to say, so without further delay, I will hand over to Chris. Hey, afternoon everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Maney. I am a Senior uh, Statistical Intelligence Analyst with Healthcare Evaluation Data or HGD. So we are a benchmarking solution based out of University Hospitals Birmingham, NHSFT. So what I'm going to do today is try and convince you that our package building is something that's both accessible and quite useful. Um, I imagine that you've got some sort of interest in that if you've logged in already. So I'm probably preaching to the converted but what I'll try and do is um, we will go through slides. Um, and I'll try and rattle through them reasonably quickly, but what we're going to spend the majority of the session on is actually building a package live. So here goes nothing with live coding on a webinar. Um, we'll build that package, we'll put it on GitHub, um, but as a little um, NHSR community bonus at the end, um, we're not going to be able to release what we've done today to CRAN, because obviously it's a demo. But uh, I have the next iteration of my funnel plot R package ready to go to Crown, so we can go through the release process today so you can see that with a real package. So in terms of overview, um, I'm going to just give you a little bit about what package is and how it's uh, sort of structured, um, the things that you need to know when you're going about building them. We'll look a little bit about functions, which are the, uh, the building blocks of what we're going to put into packages and some of the bells and whistles around how we might go about documenting them, uh, putting bits and pieces into uh, help files and vignettes and other bits that you might find associated with packages that tell you how to use it. And there's a few other things that you need to know about how we uh, build the packages, how we determine what the packages depend on in terms of other R packages uh, and how we, we make sure that it passes all the various checks for release. So by way of a couple of extras that I will touch on, but we won't go into great depth. Um, pairing package building up with source control techniques is really, really useful and quite important, particularly if you plan to collaborate with anyone at all. Um, so we'll look a little bit about how Git and GitHub can be used as they are. They seem to be reasonably common standards for doing this. We'll look a little bit at unit testing and what code coverage means related to that. And finally, as I said, yeah, we'll go through uh, releasing to CRAN. Uh, there's a couple of links here. So um, Hadley Wickham originally wrote a book a number of years back on building our packages, uh, and that's been updated recently with a second uh, edition uh, with input from Jenny Bryan and a bunch of other people. 
Um, that's a great resource that tells you everything that you need to know in more depth that we'll go into today. And if you really want the depth of the documentation, there's the official R documentation here, the building R packages or building R extensions, I think it's called. Um, but that really is the nuts and bolts of how to do it. So if you're not using tools to help you to do this and you were just conducting it from scratch, building it yourself, you would need to follow all of the, co the conventions within that document. So R packages. So you probably use them all the time and you probably don't necessarily realise that when you install R, it comes with a bunch of core packages anyway, which you don't necessarily explicitly load, but they're already loaded in the environment. So things like um, the stats package and the utils and things like that are all there in the background. And they're the bits and pieces that R is using to perform the various functions you type into the console. Very commonly now, I think people who are new to R are often taught through tidyverse ways. So you're probably familiar with tidyverse or dplyr at least. Um, ggplot2 is a, a common plotting package. So very often the things that you want to achieve with R are coming through um, using specific packages that are tailored to do a particular job. The easiest place to get R packages are from, is from CRAN. So if you use the R uh, commands to install packages, it goes and looks at the comprehensive R archive network, I believe it is. Um, so when I checked the other day, there were 1600, 100 and 81, sorry, 16,000, sorry, 181 packages available at that point. So that goes up and down and making head or tail of them is obviously quite difficult, but it tends to be that things that are popular rise up through the community and people know um, what they're looking for, but you can also search it for things like that. But it's not the end of the road in terms of where packages are available from. Uh, if you're involved with bioinformatics, there's a lot of packages associated with the Bioconductor project. Um, and also many people publish them to GitHub. So if you don't want to have to go through all of the CRAN checking process, um, you don't want to have it available broadly, but you still want to publish the code, you can always use something like GitHub to do that. Um, but also you may want to publish it internally and just use it within your organization, in which case you would look to build a, a so-called binary version of it or source if you're using Linux. Um, and then you can share that as a zip file or as the, the original R code. So what are they? So really they're collections of functions and those functions are generally working together or in some cases they don't necessarily need to be related. They might just be so in the, in the case of one of our internal packages at UHB, it's just a bunch of functions that we need for doing the day job. They don't always relate to each other, but it's a handy place to keep them all together. Um, but very often uh, a package is related to a particular workflow and it has various functions that bolt on different extensions to that as it goes. Uh, and it's entirely up to the package author what goes in. You can have a single function or many, many functions that go into a package. So why would you use them? Well, I, I say don't reinvent the wheel. If somebody's written the code to do a job and it's already there, like I am never going to write a better plotting package than um, ggplot2 or, or um, plotly or anything like that. Um, I'm, it's just not how I'm, I'm wired. So you would use one that's written by an expert. So that's what that kind of slightly sarky second line is there is. A, do you really know how to do whatever it is better than the expert who wrote that package? I'd say probably not in many cases. So it's worth starting with the packages that some experts or people who've at least spent a lot of time working in a particular area have built. So why would you build a package? Well, you might be that person who's the expert who knows all the stuff that needs to be used by other people. You might be um, you know, Hadley Wickham's, for example, who has a, a vision of certain things he's trying to build and he amasses them together over a number of years. Um, it might be that you are the keenest R user in your organization and a way for you to move forward together would be to coordinate the different pieces of R scripts that are being used regularly across your teams. If you pull them together, it can be held in a central place where everyone is working from the same common standard. But the first thing I think many people think is I can't do it. It's really complicated. Well, how am I going to do that? I don't know how people build, write code and, and deploy it. And as gently as possible, I will encourage you that you can. Um, I didn't know how to do it. Um, I started by watching a YouTube video, believe it or not, of somebody building a package. Um, I realized that he, he built it in about five minutes flat, so it really couldn't be that difficult. Cue me then building a very basic package within about half an hour and then uh, spending the next few days working on all the errors that I've made. But 
it is slow and you will get things wrong and that's part of the process and you will learn a lot about R and you'll learn a lot about your code as you go into the process of trying to generalize it and make it available to other people but there's loads and loads of material online there's loads of support from people who've been there before and done similar things and the nice thing about working with open source stuff is you can actually pull the source code for other packages and see how other people have laid packages out so if you're particularly interested in, in complex packages, you could go and pull something like dplyr from the, the tidyverse and look at uh, the complexity of how that code is laid out. Um, or if you want something slightly simpler, um, everything that we do today um, will be available for you to see afterwards. So you can replace that shell with the things that you want to work in. But the very first thing that we need to do then is make our code a bit more generic, because if you've written an R script and it's really, really closely tied to your particular data set or a very specific naming convention, then it's not very um, user friendly for other people to apply that elsewhere. So we need to look at making it a little bit more generic. Uh, so what we're going to do is look about how to convert our code into a function. So Here's my terrible explanation of a function, but it's to serve a purpose for today. So really uh, what I'm trying to impress upon you is that a function has some sort of generic input it does something to it and gives a generic output. So what we're going to do is take this kludgy data frame here that I've got with just three rows. So it's got a column called ID and it's got a column called old col, which has got three numeric values in it. We're going to take this data frame and look at converting what would be a sort of relatively standard-ish piece of R code that you might have written in your script while you're doing some work. So here, I'm creating in this data frame a new column by taking the old column, adding two and a half to it, and then dividing the lot by 50. I don't know why you'd need to do that, but it's a perfectly normalish thing to do some sort of numeric calculation on some data. Um, so having done that, I've created a new column in my data frame, which if I print the data frame, you can see here, there's a new column there. But that's really, really tied to this data frame. It's using the names of that data frame and it's ex explicitly using the slot within the data frame with that name. So let's turn it into a function then. So what I've done here is I've created something called my function as a function. Now functions, when you open the, the round brackets, first of all, um, these are the parameters you're putting in. So these are the things that you pass into the function and control. We then open the curly brackets uh, and everything within those brackets is the script that gets run against your generic inputs. So I'm taking my generic input called col and I'm creating something called RTN or return. Return is col plus 2.5 divided by 50. Now col can be anything that we pass into this function and that's the point of making it generic. And then we've got a line here telling us to return that value. So if I then apply the same thing to my data frame, I'm going to create another column called new column two because I'm good at naming things. Um, but you can see here, I'm saying new column two is my function and I'm feeding my function that we've just created with the column. So then if I print that data frame, it's done exactly the same thing here. But the important point here is that I could pass any numeric variable into that and it would do the same thing. So we've made a generic function. So roughly speaking, a function has got three components. So you need some sort of name to, to declare the function as. You need to give it some sort of input. Now that you don't always strictly need to give it an input. It, it could work without an input, but really what we're trying to do here is have a an agnostic kind of mechanism to do a job. So we're giving it some sort of input, which here is calls, and we're going to get it to return some sort of value. So by default, functions will always return the last line of code um, unless you explicitly put a return statement on the end, which you don't have to do that. Uh, and it can make your code shorter if you know the conventions and you play to them. Um, but I think for readability, it's quite helpful to explicitly use return for, for my personal preferences. So We've got a function, we're going to convert our code into functions if we want to put them in packages. 
And it's then that we use these functions and bolt them together in different ways if you want to get more complex. Now we've got a function, we need to explain what that function is doing. We need to have some support documentation around it. So we need some help files. Preferably, we need some sort of examples for users. Um, and the other things we need to consider are in the process of using our function, do we need some functions from another package as well? Uh, and I would suggest that sometimes we do. So we need a way to declare what those dependencies are. Um, and as your functions get more and more elaborate, it's actually, it's sort of better practice to put things like explicit error handling in. So in my function there, it's a numeric thing. If I passed some text into this, I would have a problem with that because it can't take two and a half away from text. So you could put some generic error handling that says if this is not a number, then throw an error and give me a warning. So we've got some functions and we're going to move into a package. So a package has got a few components. And as we go through this, we're going to use our studio tools combined with the dev tools package, the use this package and the test that package um, to do a lot of this for us, as well as the Roxygen 2 package. And I'll show you what they do as we go. But our, our R package has a description file and this is our metadata. So this is when you uh, you Google an R package and it takes you to the crown page where it tells you the name of it, the description, the who created it, the dates, the version numbers. Uh, that all comes from the description file and that gets loaded into R when you download it. Uh, the namespace is a slightly trickier convention if you're not new to them, but it's essentially a, a kind of machine readable um, description of the environment for R. So it knows what functions you have in your environment, what to import from other environments and what to export. Um, we're not going to build namespaces ourselves. We're going to use a tool to generate them for us as part of the build process. We've got these functions that we talked about building a second ago. And we've also got some help files, which are the, the text around the help files. So if you look in the help in RStudio or you press question mark and then you type the name of a function, it will take you to a, a help file. Um, these should tell you quite a lot of standard things that you need to know about most functions, but um, they are the quality varies on the author, shall we say. Um, but if you follow the R guidance, they're written in a format that's similar to LaTeX, if you're familiar with that, which is a, a sort of markup language for publishing. Um, but it's common actually to just write them um, if you're in R Studio and others with um, a certain sets of tags which work with the Roxygen 2 package, which transforms your tags into all the appropriate documentation in the same sort of way that Markdown would do it. And there's a few optional things. So there are vignettes. Now, personally, I think you should always include a vignette or at least one with your package, which is a worked example of how to do a thing. So um, for my funnel plot package, I have a vignette saying, what is a funnel plot? Why would you use it? Here's how to use the function. Uh, which I think helps users, particularly the likes of me, who I would prefer to see someone use something often rather than read a dense set of documentation behind it. Uh, and unit tests. And uh, unit tests are really useful functions um, to include in packages, which are automated sets of tests which help to pick up if you've made any errors. Um, so if you continue iterating and working on your package and changing things, it might be that you break something that was working before. Uh, unit tests are a good way of spotting this sort of thing. So a quick word about dependencies then. So this is the idea that your R package might use functions from another package, which is perfectly normal. So let's say in your first local R package for your organization, um, a number of the things you do regularly uses a whole load of dplyr code to prepare the data. So you need to indicate to your, uh, your package that um, it requires dplyr, otherwise it won't work. So if people go about installing it, it needs to make sure that they also have dplyr installed. So there's a few ways of doing this, and this is done really in the description file, which then writes the namespace. So you have a number of tags. So one is import. So this is the one I'm going to recommend you use rather than the field depends. Um, so if you put a list of your packages that you want wholly imported uh, at the same time as when you load the package, um, if you put them in the imports field, um, I will connect the dots and we'll make sure that you have that. Uh, there is also a field called suggests. Now, um, it takes quite a while to get your head around what should go in quite which field, but I'm going to say that suggests is really a courtesy to your users, quoting some Hadley Wickham's um, package development book. 
the idea would be that you put stuff in the suggests field that um, is required for your vignettes. So the, those worked examples. So you, strictly, you don't need to build the vignettes to use the package. So you don't necessarily need to use them. So suggests is used often in that case. Uh, there is another field called depends and depends was a sort of older field before imports kind of overtook it um, before namespaces were implemented in R. So that would at, at load, it would attach all of the packages um, sort of manually, whereas the namespace is a more sophisticated way of doing that. So I'd suggest you probably want imports rather than depends. Uh, and should you go a bit further and be worried about efficiency of stuff and you want to write things in C++ or in other languages that link in, you can use the linking to description, which links to uh, other files. Uh, and there is also one for enhances, uh, which I never quite got my head around the use of that, but uh, it's, I think, strictly supposed to indicate whether your package can enhance other packages. Um, uh, so I will refer you to this really good post um, and talk by Jim Hester, uh, who's a member of the R Studio team um, related to dependencies, and it debates the should you have lots of dependencies, shouldn't you have lots of dependencies, what are the pros and cons and difficulties of doing that. But the bit of um, advice I will state, which is quoting Hadley Wickham again, is beware of using the tidyverse as a dependency. So this is a, a quote from something he published a while ago. Um, but the nuts and bolts of it is that the tidyverse is a quick way of loading all the associated tidyverse packages into your environment. Uh, it's, made, it's built for exploratory data analysis uh, and working on things um, in your analysis session. It's not designed for package development. If you're developing a package, you need to be a little bit more specific about the things that you want rather than just dumping everything in because it's going to take up an awful lot of space in your computer's memory, etc. Uh, and it's it, essentially it's a little bit careless to import far many more things than you need to. So in terms of extras, um, I talked a little bit about source control before and the point of source control is it, it's like um, this, if you ever use track changes and such in Word, the idea would be that each time you alter a file, you want some way to know who altered it, what they altered and have an ability to roll it back if it doesn't work properly. So um, the tool Git, brilliantly named, um, is a, a common tool for doing that. Um, and it has a whole set of uh, commands and a discipline around using it, which I'm not going to talk about today. But I'm going to suggest to you that it's also good to get a handle on using Git um, for doing this sort of thing because it can really help your workflow. Um, but what it essentially does is it creates a local repository of the changes that you've made and you then synchronize that local repository with a remote. So an, an external or another location. So uh, in this case, we're going to use GitHub as a remote. But the idea is that any other users who are working on it will share the same remote and they will all work on their machines and they will send their changes, etc., to the remote. And at the remote, you can work on how to integrate them and to resolve any conflicts. Um, so I can recommend um, Jenny Bryan's book, um, Happy Git with R, um, which is really quite comprehensive for getting used to using Git uh, in a, an R context. Um, but GitHub's quite useful as well because it has a bunch of wizzy things that help. Like um, it will automatically, if you put a file called readme.md, which is marked down into the, the, the home directory of the thing that you load up, it will realize that that is the page to load as your landing page. So there's a few conventions to do with GitHub that help. So if you put a readme in, it will help to know what it is they're looking at. And I mentioned unit tests before, um, but the, and the idea is that it's an automatic test. Um, but you do need to write these tests and they're specific to your package. They're not generic tests. Um, so it's commonly done with a test this package, sorry, test that package. Uh, and in terms of setup, um, we're going to use um, a function in the use this package. Use this is brilliant because it automates lots of the setup of things without you, be, with, so you don't have the ability to get it wrong, I guess. Um, so we'll use that to set up tests, but, but broadly it creates a, a control script called test that, and then it has a subdirectory with scripts that run different sets of tests within them. Uh, if you want to know more about that, the vignette's really good, uh, and there's loads of examples online of people using it. But one of the other things you might have seen if you've looked at other packages people have developed is code coverage using something like the Covar package. The idea of that is to make an assessment of your code against the tests that you've written and say how what sort of percentage of your code is being covered by your tests. 
So if you uh, are working on a big project with several developers, for example, it might be that people throw bits and pieces into uh, the project and they get accepted, but the project grows and actually the percentage of the project that's covered by tests goes down if they don't write tests. So it's, a, it's handy to know how much of your work is actually being properly tested. Another thing you'll see is so-called continuous integration. So this is really important when you're building larger projects. So for something like Tidyverse packages, where there are lots and lots of contributors, lots and lots of issues, lots of people working on them, um, each time people push changes, we need to make sure that they don't break the package or they necessarily will break the package at times. So we need to be able to catch them and see what, what happens. So continuous integration is a way to continually build the package after each set of changes. And there's a number of different providers for doing that. Um, I've recently just changed my packages on GitHub um, to use GitHub Actions, which is a, a really nice, tidy way of doing continuous integration. Um, but Travis CI is also a common one as well. Travis builds in um, a Linux environment. So uh, if you are working on a Windows machine um, and you want to check that it also builds on Linux, Travis is quite useful. But I would really recommend GitHub Actions because it just works out a little bit smoother. And there's also package down, which is an automated package documentation framework that builds a website that you can deploy with your package. I've just spotted a, um, a question, so I'm going to publish that and say, what can you do if you're embarrassed by your code? Uh, I have some code that works and it might be worth sharing as a package, but it's quite inefficient and slow. Um, I would say brilliant publish it, have a go. Um, the, the first time you do it is terrifying, essentially, because you think everyone's going to think my work's rubbish, they're going to see how bad I am at doing it. Um, but everybody feels like that, everyone's in the same boat. Like, so much of what I publish is rubbish and it will get better by other people seeing it uh, and suggesting, why don't you do it this way? Or you'll come back to it in a year's time and think, why did I write it like that? It's terrible. Um, but it, uh, the the process of being open and transparent about it and inviting input, um, I think is quite helpful, but it, but it is, it is scary, it is daunting, but I'd encourage you to give it a try um, because you might be surprised by what help you can get. Um, if you want to try it locally, find, find some colleagues who are interested first, you know, to try it that way. So I'm also going to tell you to trust in the use this package. This is so helpful for setting things up and we're going to use it quite a bit as we build the package ahead of us. So let's go ahead then and build a package. So what I'm going to do is create a new package using an R Studio template. We're going to write a function um, or I may copy and paste it over depending on what time we've got. Um, then we're going to insert a Roxygen skeleton to use that to build the, um, the uh, help files that are associated with it. We'll then look at building our package uh, and how we check that and we might write a brief unit test and then we're going to push this all over to GitHub as well. So as I say, we'll use the tools that are available in our studio and associated with DevTools, use this, etc. on Oxygen. Um, but a little tip, if you're on Windows, um, you also need to install the R tools uh, tool chain because Windows doesn't natively have all of the bells and whistles for building our packages. Uh, if you're using Mac OS or Linux, um, then you're fine. It will just build. Um, but if you're on Windows, you do need to, to go through the R tools process. And there's a link on here to take you to it or just Google R tools. Uh, and here is a pre prepared version of what we're going to do now, uh, just in case we don't get through everything in time. So you, you feel free to go and have a look at that. So I'm going to come out of here. I'm going to move over to R Studio. So what I'm going to do here, I've got a blank R Studio setting, and if this looks unfamiliar to you, um, it's because I'm just using R Studio Server. Uh, it works in my web browser, um, but it, it should work just the same. Um, so what we're first of all we're going to do is we're going to create um, a new project. So I'm going to go to the project menu here and go for a new project. Now I'm going to use the layout that's available for me here. So I've gone to create a new project. I'm going to create an R package here. And this is helpful because it sets up some structures for us and gives us some examples to work with and use. So I'm going to create a, a brilliant new package. Um, you've got some other helpful things here. So you can 
add source files into it. So if you've already got some script, you can add it in there. You can also create a Git repository with just a tick here if you've got Git installed on your system, but I'll do that with use this in a second instead. So I'm going to click create project and this will just wear away for a second and it will set up some stuff in the background for me. OK, so what it's done here is it's if you look in the, um, the, the files window here. I'm just going to order this here, so it's created a couple of folders, one called R and one called man. In the man, we've got all the uh, the, the documentation that's associated with it. Uh, it's also created a default namespace and a description file for us, uh, and it's opened a script here called hello.r, which is an example of a function. So we've got a function called hello, which uh, opens a function print hello world. So I'm going to leave that because we don't want to do that, but I'm going to go and create a new function myself. And you can see what's going on here. Chris, sorry. Yeah, uh, sure. Would you mind zooming in somehow to make it a bit more visible? Yeah, I'll see what I can do. Yeah. Is that any better? So I'm sure we shall see and wait, I guess. Thank okay. You. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create um, a confidence interval formula. So um, you can functionally ignore the maths of this because this function could be anything. So this is um, a formula that um, I use sometimes for confidence intervals, but I'm going to make it into a function. So I, I'm going to do the, the lower confidence interval here first. So I'm going to call it my CI lower function. So you remember before we had a the way to declare a function was to use a function here. And in the round brackets, we add the names of our parameters. So the things that we're going to supply to it are a value that's in question, the standard error associated with or standard deviation it is, I guess. Um, we'll call it SD. Um, and the probability. So we want to specify, say, a 95% confidence interval. We want to specify that as a probability. Um, but what I'm going to do here is add a default value in. So I'm going to say that unless somebody specifies otherwise, prob is always going to default to 95. So here um, I have now uh, opened my function. This is a blank function with some inputs. So the first thing I'm going to do is work out what the two tail probability is. So for those of you who know a little bit about probability, um, knowing that it's a 95% confidence interval, actually what I probably want is 2.5% at the top and 2.5% in the bottom, not 5% just at one end. So um, a function for getting around this is um, 1 minus the probability over two. But the thing that I'm writing here, this could be any function at all. It could be your model that you build for a particular thing. It could be your analysis um, pathway for a particular thing. It could be a set of dplyr code. It could be a ggplot. It could, it could be anything that goes into a function that you want to make gen uh, generic. Um, so uh, let's just ignore this for a second because the details are just a tiny bit too specific for this. I should have done something a bit more general, shouldn't I? So I'm going to copy this over from a pre-prepared one because it's a little bit complicated. But this is essentially a formula for working out. This will calculate that it's 1.96, essentially times the standard error or standard deviation. So that's a function right there. So if you were to declare that, Right now, it would appear in your environment here as a function. So I'm just going to remove that. But that's not sufficient to get at that point. Package. What we need to do is we want some documentation around this. So I mentioned the Roxygen um, uh, package before. So what I'm going to do is insert a Roxygen skeleton. So that's going to read my function and work out some of the default things that I need to put in. So if you go to uh, code, so you need to make sure that your cursor is within your function. Code, we want insert Roxygen skeleton. So, haha, so you can see there's some tags here that have appeared. So title, so I, I want the title of my function to go in here. So I'm going to call it um, lower CI function. So 
So and the things that it's sniffed out from my function is that there's three parameters. So it's parameter value, SD and prob. So I need a description against each of those to tell you what they are. So that could be any value that we want to calculate our confidence interval on. Standard deviation for the sample. Prob the Okay, so the probability of the confidence interval. Um, so given that we've got a default value, you might actually want to say something like default equals 0.5 corresponding to a 95% sample. So then there's another couple of tags here. So returns, returns is helpful to tell your users what output it's going to get. So this um, is essentially like a, a vector type formula. So um, we're going to say uh, if it takes a numeric, it's going to return a numeric value for lower CI. Now export, we're not going to add anything here, but this is uh, a function that tells Roxygen that this function needs to go into the namespace, needs to be exportable, so it can be used outside the package. And then there's an examples section here. So let's say um, when you look in our help files, for example, let's do uh, help LM for linear model. If we search down here, it's got usage, arguments, etc., details, values, um, and that is an old one, so it doesn't have returns. But we've got um, examples here, and you can see there's some code underneath as an example. So we want to give an example really for our function. So I'm going to say my CI lower, as if it's got um, a value of 100 and a standard deviation of 10. That would be an example of its use. So now I need to save this. And what we want to do is we want to make sure we save it in the R folder here. So I'm going to call this CI functions. Now each of these different sections here, you can um, put as many functions in an R script as you want. Uh, and the uh, the contents of each file is up to you really for how you organize your um, your package development. So that's the lower confidence interval. So if I wanted also to have the upper confidence interval, I'm going to change this to upper. So I've just put a second function underneath. And I'm just going to change the places where it says lower to upper. Probably find and replace. No, that would have been quick. And the difference here is that I need a plus. And I also need to call that upper. So now I've got two functions, um, one of which is a lower and an upper. So realistically, that is the basic shell of our functions for the package. So before we go about building it though, let's back up out of the R folder and let's have a quick look at the description file. So the description file here has read some metadata from what we put into the template. So it's realized that my package is called Brilliant um, and its type is a package. So it's saying the title, what your package does. This package updates um, confidence intervals. You can put a version number in here. You can put the author, but you should really put the author. It's good discipline. And then the package maintainer is also required as well. So I'll say me. And it does require an email address if you want it to go on to Crown. Yeah, you could put some more things in um, and 
because we're a little bit tight on time, I'm going to just copy this over from the one I did earlier. So <laughs> that was all the problem. Um, so license, um, licensing is a, a whole rabbit hole to go down. But um, be aware that when you publish something, um, you should really indicate what the licensing status of it is. Um, can people reuse it? Is it open source or not? And under what terms? Um, what I'm going to do is use an MIT license because um, I like the terms of MIT license. But what I'm going to, how I'm going to do that is I'm going to code it by using the use this package. So in use this, there's a function called use MIT license and it requires a name. Any enter. That's going to call it names. So there we go. This has now done a bunch of the work for me. So it's set the active project to this. It's written the license file um, and it's added it to the R build ignore. So this is an important file here. So if you have things in your package structure that um, don't need to be built into the package itself, but they should logically be contained with it, like development versions or more extra sort of bits and pieces of metadata that you don't need. Uh, you can add them to the R build ignore file. And R knows that when you build this, you're not concerned about it picking up those files and including them, and then it won't throw errors on build. So now we'll just go back over to that description. You'll see now that that license has changed to MIT plus file license. So the license is here. As you can see it's now got a copyright to me and the terms of the MIT license. So that is our bare bones of a package. So what you could now do is build this. So you can see on the top here we have a build section. This is also a build menu. So first things first, go into your build menu and check configure build tools. There's a bunch of things here that help. So I'm going to click generate documentation with Roxygen 2. So now it's asking me exactly which bits do I want to build with Roxygen 2. I'm also going to say vignettes because I haven't got a vignette at the moment. And I'm going to tell it to automatically Roxygenize, which is build them whenever we install and restart. So this will make more sense when you see what it does. So I'm going to click OK there. RStudio uses this default um, extension onto the build, um, the install and restart, which is just uh, just accept that for now. But the one thing to add is that when you run checks, there are a whole bunch of different types of checks you could run. But I want it to run the CRAN checks. Uh, so for submitting this to CRAN repository, so I'm going to add the extension here as CRAN, which is a reserved term which tells it to use the the checks that CRAN uses. So now we're going to try and build this. So we're going to go install and restart. So this will give you some progress here. So it's telling me first time using Roxygen 2 and it's automatically upgrading it, updating the Roxygen version. It's writing the documentation. So these RD files, these are the help files. So an existing namespace already exists so that's because our studio generated a namespace for us so really what we want is we want roxygen to generate that so i'm going to select my namespace delete it and i'm going to build it again so you should see that it now writes the namespace and there we go it's saying uh it's giving me some warnings here. There's an unexpected header for value. Um, in my CI lower 16. So the useful thing here is that you want to find and work out what's going on to give you these um, different error messages. Um, and because we're a bit short on time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy my functions from my pre-prepared earlier one over because I know there was no problems with those, but they're exactly the same functions, which you'll see here, they're the CI upper, CI lower. 
So it's important for you to know that you will get this wrong a whole bunch of times and you should follow the error messages and find out the line numbers and the functions that they're in and go and check what it is they relate to. So now we should see that build without the same problems because I don't know what they are and I haven't really got time to chase them down before our webinar will end. I think Chris it was just you've got an example section but nothing in the examples. Ah oh, thanks Tom. Um, so yeah, there's there's a whole bunch of things like that that are fairly logical, but you will end up scratching your head for a minute while you figure them out. So just to look at the namespace file, so I've mentioned that a few times and said don't worry about it, but so you'll get this if you're using Roxygen, that it was generated by Roxygen, so don't edit it yourself. So this here has got the functions that it's exported and it's telling me that it's imported some, uh, which is something I forgot to tell you before. So if I go back to my function here. As part of my function, I'm using a couple of um, pre-packaged functions in R. So I'm using QNorm, which is part of the stats package in R. So for it to be truly portable, my package needs to know that it requires stats. Now, everybody has a stats package if you install R because it's part of the base definitions, but good practice would be to indicate that. So here I'm going to use the import from the stats package QNorm. So that tells R that that needs to go into the namespace. But what you could also do um, here would be if you want to um, add your depends or your imports, you would add it in here and then you would add the list of packages. So um, I don't need to do this for stats as I say, so you would do import stats and let's say you also had dplyr, you would add a list like that and you could add the packages that you depend on into this. And when you um, build that, it would then import them into the namespace. If I try and build this now, it'll tell me that it can't find dplyr anywhere. So why have I done it? Because it is quite helpful. But I won't do that. So I'll install and restart. So I also mentioned git and github to you. So in order to short circuit getting around this, I'm not going to teach you about git. But I'm going to enable it by again using the use this package. I'm going to start with use git. So this is telling me what it's just done. It's saying it's set the active project to this. It's initialized the git repository. It's added some files to the git ignore. So similar to the um, R build ignore, some files that would need to be ignored. And it's telling me that there are a bunch of uncommitted files. So in git parlance, you commit a file when you've made a change to it and you've told Git to keep a record of it. So it's asking me, is it okay to commit them? And my options are yes, not now, or nope. So I'm gonna say yes. And it's telling me that it's added them and it needs to restart our studio. Um, is that okay? So this will restart and this will then bring up a git pane in the top right as well so that you can use our studios integrated git functions. So I mentioned that git is a local repository but I also want a remote repository on github so I'm also again going to use use this and use github. When you do this you'll need to set up your credentials so if you are unfamiliar with that check out that uh, happy git with r um, link in the main presentation and that will show you quite a bit of how to do that so i'm going to tell it to use um so it's, there's two different types of authentication it can use ssh if you know what you're doing i would say https if you don't know what ssh is will probably be easier in the short term um that's because I already created one called Brilliant when I was testing this out, which was my bad. Um, but then you would then have a link to the repository and each time you make a change that you want to send to the remote, you would then do a, a so-called push, which sends it up to the repository. And that really is the basics of your package. You don't need to go a whole load further. But I did mention before checks. So if you want to check this package that it complies with the various different things that are essential for going into CRAN, we can click on check here and this runs the CRAN arguments. So it's going to check a whole bunch of things are in the right places. And you can go back through the log and see what it's checking. So it's checking that it's using various different 
options, it's checking the portable file names, sufficient correct permissions, etc. So it's doing a whole bunch of checks that are essential for CRAN. So it's told me there, I have a check description, malformed title should end in a period. So uh, Americans, so it should have um, a full, so it should, what was that? So it should not end in a period, it should, it should not have full stop. That would correct that note. So you get a bunch of different things out of it. You can see all these ticks there for things it's passed. An E is an error. So we then need to go and work out what that error is. So it could not find function hello. Uh, oh, that's because I forgot to delete that. So let's delete that one. That was the, the one that was um, the demonstration in the environment for us. So I'll install and restart and then you could do your checks again, etc., and go from there. So that really is the basis of doing this here. If you want to do more of the bits and pieces I talked about before, like using the um, the code coverage, for example, I'm uh, sorry, the um, continuous integration. So that is where we get it regularly built for us. I would recommend you go with use this and use GitHub Actions. So I use uh, check full. Um, so that then will go and set it up on the GitHub repository and it will run checks against Mac OS, Windows and several different Linux distributions. Um, and you can go on your GitHub repository and you can check whether it's built or had errors in each of those. And that tells you quite a lot about it. If you want to do the unit tests as well, that I mentioned before, we'll again have used this and we'll look for use. Test that. The structure for tests for us. So it's telling me that it's added test that into the suggests field in my description and it's created the different folders for my tests. So in the tests directory now we've got a script called test that which basically says load the package and then run the tests. But within the test folder we will then see um, a space where we can write the scripts. So I'm going to copy a test over from um, the one that is on the on GitHub that I will refer you to afterwards because I don't have much time to go further today. So I'm going to create a new R script. So this is using test that syntax. So I'm going to test that the CI upper is higher than the CI lower and it has a bunch of functions for expectations. So we expect if I run the upper one, it will be lower. Sorry, it'll be higher than the upper one. It'd be greater than etc and we can test for the types of returns so i'm testing that this is numeric so i'm just going to save that as a test we need to save it in the tests test that folder test uh, i'll call it ci's so then i'm going to install and restart this again And when you run your CRAN checks in future, it will run the tests as well. But you can specifically just run the tests. So you can run test package or again from the, the build menu. And it will run DevTools tests. And it will tell me there that actually three of those tests, it passed, it was OK. And if it didn't pass, you'll get the different categories and it'll tell you which ones didn't pass. And then that kind of helps you because it tells you where to go looking for the reason why your package isn't working or isn't building. So we're getting a bit tight on time. We've only got five minutes left here. Um, but what I'm going to do is switch over and I might go a minute or two over. Um, so forgive me for that, but I think it's important to show you this. Uh, I'm going to move over to a package that I've previously built, which is the funnel plotter package. So this builds funnel plots, um, which are a way of comparing observational data against a measure of the size and adding uh, limits that are similar to control limits in it. So now this is opened up. First of all, don't worry about what's on here. Just uh, look at the uh, the structure here. So from what we saw previously, we had an R folder with our scripts in. We had man with our uh, various different help files and such in. Um, but I've got a bunch of other things. So I've got tests like you saw before. I've also got vignettes. So I mentioned about a vignette before. 
So vignettes are worked examples and you can write them using our markdown here. So I've written one here on how to use funnel plots using our markdown. So for those of you who use our markdown before, there's a particular set of things you need in the YAML header, but you can get them through the use this, use, uh, what is it? Uh, I spelled that wrong. Yes, that's why it's not doing autocomplete. I think it's an MD vignette. Yeah, vignette. So if you use this function, uh, as the name suggests, it will create all of the right YAML for you so that your package knows exactly where to write its um, different entries for. So it really is handy to keep using the use this package. But backing up here to my structure. So it's only a more complicated version of what we've just seen. So you can see I have a bunch of different functions here. And I have one overall control function. So let's make this a bit bigger so you can see it. So I've got a lot more details on the help file here for each of my parameters, for example, a lot more in the description. Um, I've got return, which is the different values that the function returns. Uh, I've also got references as well because they're based on some academic references and you can see the more extensive examples here. And it imports quite a few more different bits from, from, from packages here. So you can see I've got stuff from scales, ggrepel, etc. And it uses and um, plots in ggplot. So I've imported the whole package for ggplot. And it takes quite a lot more inputs as well. So this is just a more extensive version of what we've just seen. But once you're happy with your package and you want to go and release that, um, what you need to do is run your, your tests and your checks and builds locally. But best practice is then to use dev tools to run check functions in other environments. So if you were to use check on Windows development or Windows release, this will send a copy of your package to a service called WinBuilder which is an automated um, service run by um, the same people who run CRAM, um, which goes and builds your package on Windows and tests it and runs checks and makes sure it's working. Similarly, if you do it with R Hub, R Hub runs it on generally three different environments. It runs it on two Linux environments and um, also on Windows. So when you look to release your package, in the steps to release the package, it will tell you or it will ask you, have you run both of these services? So make sure you run both of these services first and they'll send you an email notification to tell you whether there's any errors, etc. when it finishes. So. I'm going to move this package now to release. So this is the um, newest version of this package. Uh, I've run all the various things that are in DevTools, but um, I thought I might as well release this with you live now. And for any of you who are interested, I will tweet out the status of it. So this will go now through the uh, release system and it will go to the CRAN moderators who will um, check whether there's any errors of it from their end and decide whether or not it then gets added into the CRAN repository. And they will email back and tell me if there's any problems that I need to change before I resubmit it. Uh, otherwise, they'll accept it. So in order to help them out, the convention here is to include an MD or markdown file called CRAN comments. So this is a bunch of comments for the CRAN moderators. So generally, this is following um, Hadley Wickham's um, sort of uh, structure for it, but it tell them what it is you're sending. And bear in mind, they do this for a lot of packages. So they don't want chapter and verse. So this is a major release of this, etc. It tells them roughly what I've added. So if anything breaks, um, you tell them where and how you've tested it. So this has had quite a lot of tests uh, locally and on different services. Um, it's done a lot on GitHub Actions and also on our hub. And then if there are any outstanding errors, they probably aren't going to accept it into CRAN. But if there are outstanding notes and that they're reasonable, like this one here, um, WinBuilder tells me that one of my URLs might be invalid, but it, it isn't and I've checked it. So I've explained that note to them. Um, and then here also downstream dependencies. Um, this is just if you have a package that other people then further use, it's uh, useful to notify them that other packages will be affected by your release. So let's release it. So using dev tools, I'm going to use release. He says having accidentally hit cat block. 
So forgive me, I know we're a minute or two over here, but I will just release this and I'll show you the process and then I'll stop. So have you checked for spelling errors? Yes, I'd use a spell checker. Have you checked that you've run the R command check? So that was the checks we used before locally, um, for sure. So it's then run a bunch of things there. And if all of them are OK, these are additional DevTools checks. You can say, of course. So were the DevTools checks successful? Yeah. Have you fixed all existing problems? Um, yes. So for things that have already been released, um, you can go and check the um, archived checks uh, from the previous system. So you go and check that URL and make sure there are no outstanding checks. So yeah. Have you checked it on our hub? So I talked about that a second ago. Uh, yes, checked that yesterday. Have you checked on WinBuilder? For sure. Yes, I checked that one yesterday. So this is just taking a second there. It's just scanning the rest of my package. It's asking me if I've, I've updated my news file. So when you do new releases, it's helpful to have um, a summary of the uh, releases in the news file. Um, so yes, I have done that, of course. Have you updated your description file? So have you changed your version number? Is all the metadata correct? Yep. Have you updated the cram comments file that I showed you a second ago? Definitely. So it's then going to check Git. So if you're using Git, it will make it will check to make sure that your version is um, up to date with the remote version. Have you checked it? Is it all successful? Have you got anything uncommitted? Um, so we'll check successful for sure. Is this your email address? So first time round, you'll register your email address. So then it will build a version of your package and then it will send that. So this is the release route via CRAN. But if you don't intend to go down the CRAN route, you can either share the code of your package um, or you can build here. So if you build a binary package, this is a zip file that you can share around with your colleagues. Uh, and then you can use it, you can install your package from a zip file in the same way that you would install from um, the normal route here. So you would simply put um, a list of the, you, you put the zip file in or you could type your install packages. So that's the way we would do it for our teams at UHB. But if you want to release it to Crown, as I say, this process here is going through. It's built my package. Now currently it's building the vignettes and the vignettes take a little bit longer to build because they've got to render uh, a bunch of markdown and build some visualizations. So it's told me there it's all now built. Am I ready to submit this to CRAN? Definitely. So now it's uploading the package and comments and it's confirming the submission. And what it's done is it will add a, um, a yeah, an additional file in here, which I was just checking to see if I can spot. But uh, we're short on time here, but it will it adds a note in. So CRAN release, there we go. So this will tell you the tag on your GitHub project that's been released. So now this is on its way. I'll get an email at my UHB email address telling me that this has been submitted and I just need to confirm that that's true and it's not um, any sort of virus attack. Um, but hopefully this should be on Crown in the next day or two. Right, well, I'm gonna stop there. I'll stop sharing my screen um, or I'll at least come back over to Teams and see if there's any um, burning questions there. Well, we have four questions, in fact. I'm not sure, do you want to answer them now or shall we answer them on Slack um, in your free time? What do you uh, think? I, I'm, I'm, happy to, I'm happy either way. Um, I can give you a very quick answer to each of them or I can answer them a bit more effectively on Crown. I'll just run through them quickly here. Yeah. How do I load a package and all its hidden functions and objects into my environment after it's been created? say if I want to work on someone else's package. So if someone else is working on a package like this and you want to pull it down, they're using GitHub um, or Git type thing, you would clone it down so you could copy it all over. But all it is, is a package structure. So um, if someone is working on it and say a shared folder on your network, all you need to do is um, either open their RStudio project or just sort of set that as a working directory and then you've got it all there ahead. 
Um, I would suggest that the Git is a better workflow for that because um, it allows you to all have local copies and sync to one. Um, could you go over how to import packages for use within a function and a package uh, as a sort of package you're building? Um, yeah, so when you're building a package, I will just move over to one of my scripts here and show you that. Um, what's a small one? Aggregate function. Okay. So what you don't want to do within these functions is you don't want to do this library. reason is that that will get in a right pickle because it will try and load things over and over again each time it runs it uh, and it will miss the fact that it's um, already in the global environment. So this is where the namespace comes in and helps. So if you want to use a particular package, um, what we need to use here in each of the functions that use them is either the import from function in Roxygen or the import. So if I wanted to import the whole of the stats package, I would use import stats. But because here I just want the function called aggregate, um, I told it to import from stats just the aggregate function. So I'm not using up too much space. So this will then automatically be transcribed over into both the description file and the namespace when you build the package if you're using um, the Roxygen set of tools. So within each function's Roxygen block at the top, what you want to do is use the import tag or the import from tag rather than using either a library function. Um, so I have a package that I developed and there are a few global variables I'd like to refer to in the functions for that package. Uh, when I run a check for this, I get a warning. Is there a way to have a global variable in a package that, that won't throw warnings? Um, there may well be, um, you would need to have something that uh, triggers on load. Uh, I'd have to go away and look that up, I think, but I think you would want something that triggers on the package load. Uh, I'm sure there are probably some hooks somewhere or other that we could put that into, um, but uh, off the top of my head, I don't know that, I'm afraid. Um, you could I'm, always... wondering what, Sorry, whether that one, I'm wondering whether that one refers a lot to the kind of um, issues that you get with non-standard evaluation and um, there, there is a kind of hook that you can put into um, the zzz.r file for yeah. uh, utils global the variables or something like that function. Okay, uh, so if we if we take that onto Slack maybe and, and bat some ideas around a bit later, is that okay? Uh, and final question I've got here is, is there a simpler way to create a local library without having to go through CRAN and Git? Can it just be saved on a local drive and shared by the team? Yes, completely. So when you create this um, uh, package structure here, uh, it's just a folder. That folder can be on a shared on a network and you can use it that way. Um, I'd suggest there's a distinction between a package user and a package builder. So you want to make sure you build a binary version of the package, so the zip file version that all your users can use. So I don't expect um, funnel plot users to be going in and working on the package. I expect them to just be using it to build a funnel plot. So all they want to do is install it. So you probably want to um, just use the um, just use the, load the package and use it. But if you want to work on it, yes, you need to either save it in a shared place where everybody can access that. Um, or um, I suggest using something like Git. So um, you can use Git without GitHub. So it's just um, a local um just record of changes that you've made so um git as a tool is very useful for doing that because it allows you to collaborate by doing that and you can set up a local repository and other things as well so um yes you can totally do it it's just a set of files in a directory somewhere but it's a bit more evolved if you use git for it uh, and it tends to work a bit better okay what I'll probably do then is stop there, if that's all right. Um, my presentation and this um, shell of the brilliant package is uh, available um, for you to look at on GitHub, on my GitHub. Um, the slides uh, are available on the NHSR community GitHub page um, as both uh, a PDF, but also they're written in our markdown. So if you're interested in that, the R markdown is there for you to see how the slides were written.
Fantastic. Thank you, Chris. I have very mm -hmm. kind words coming in the Q&A saying how brilliant it was. Um, so I just quickly posted link again for Mentimeter to everyone who stayed. If you can fill the form later, it would be fantastic so you can know how to make our webinars better. And thank you one again, once again to Chris and thank you for everyone who attended. Um, and we will see you in October. Bye. Great. Thanks, everyone. Bye.